Welcome to Unpacking Peanuts, the podcast where three cartoonists take an in-depth look at the greatest comic strip of all time, Peanuts by Charles M. Schultz. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. We are discussing 1983 here, so get your new wave shades on and uh, let's go back to the 80s. I'll be your host for the proceedings. My name is Jimmy Gownley. I'm also a cartoonist. I did the Amelia Rule series and books like Seven Good Reasons Not to Grow Up and The Dumbest Idea Ever. And joining me as always are my pals, co-hosts, and fellow cartoonists. He's a playwright and a composer, both for the band Complicated People, as well as for this very podcast. He's the co-creator of the original comic book Price Guide, the original editor of Amelia Rules, and the creator of such great strips as Strange Attractors, A Gathering of Spells, and Tangled River. It's Michael Cohen. Say hey. And he is the executive producer and writer of Mystery Science Theater 3000, a former vice president of Archie Comics, and the creator of the Instagram sensation Sweetest Beast. It's Harold Buckholtz. Hello. All right. So, guys, we are here in 1983. This is like the heart of my childhood. So I'm I'm really enjoying uh, revisiting these strips that I remember seeing uh, the first time around. How old were you in 83? 11. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it's a good time to be falling in love with media. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, yeah, yeah. No, it's it. This is like the the period of time when you know pop culture really was made for my generation, right? From like say the mid eighties right. to the mid nineties, that yeah. was like. And for me, anything after like nineteen seventy is like a blur. Right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as, as they I mean, say, you, you kind of remember because you made some reference to sunglasses. Uh-huh. You still have yeah. some uh, references, nineteen eighty references that mean something to you. <laughs> yes, totally do. Yeah, many of them. Yeah, and the, they say that whatever you fall in love with at the age of ten, you probably will love the rest of your life. I think oh, there's I some absolutely truth in that. believe that. Yeah. Uh, well, Michael and I have talked about this. How like the comic books you read when you were a kid, like nine or ten years old, no matter how dumb or stupid they might be, when you see them as an adult, ooh, they glow. Like they're like they're mystical. They're so yeah. wonderful. No, it's amazing. But the, but he, then you'll read the one right after it. Like if you didn't happen to have that issue and it's <laughs> like, oh, this is terrible. This is what I really fell apart that much. Wow. But generally they're all terrible, but something about those covers right. s- seems especially magical. But this year might be the, let's see, 83 is probably the year I got back into reading comics after like 10 years. Oh, wow. Especially, and it was all like Cerebus, Love and Rockets. Right. In black and white indies. I would love to do a podcast. I know we're not going to, but this this era of comics in general, I think is a real golden age. Uh, and I know obviously it's because I was a kid, but also like the black and white boom happens in like 84 in, in comic books and the comic books are just flooded with ridiculous, stupid comics. A lot of them only had yeah. one issue and I loved them. They're the so Adventures fun. of Jello Man. Sure. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Unauthorized. <laughs> the Gumby uh, Summer Fun Special, are uh, all the oh Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle ripoffs. Yeah, yeah, I, I was definitely part of that myself. I had a comic came out on right on the tail end of that. It lasted just a, over a decade, but it boy, it was it was special, and it really hasn't been documented much. It's one of those things that I, I'm expecting in time someone is going to step in and start to kind of try to recreate what that world was like. Why there was this little black and white golden age. Absolutely. That would be fun. And just to get an app that has all of those things that you could download, that would be very, very cool. But the one thing I want to talk about with the 80s, it made me think of, I think uh, one of the recent episodes, Michael said, you know, we were saying Schultz was the funniest guy in the 1960s. And, and who would that be in the 70s? And who would that be in the 80s? Well, this is something that struck me while reading this. I think if you had to, if you gave a poll in 1983 and said, who's the funniest person in America? I think probably the answer would be Eddie Murphy, right? Hmm. This is the year of like Beverly Hills Cop and his album, mm-hmm. which was Comedian or whatever I think it was called, or Delirious. I always, the TV show was like Delirious and this album was called Comedian, I think. Anyway, 
My point is, you know, I've raised a couple Gen Zers and they and they know Eddie Murphy and have seen Eddie Murphy movies, but like later Eddie Murphy movies and stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. And if I said, here you go, I want you to read a month's worth of peanut strips and I want you to listen to this honeymooner skit on Eddie Murphy comedian, which one is better? They would be repulsed by the Eddie Murphy thing. Like, and, and that was something that was just super popular. I mean, super popular. What about it? Would they be repulsed by the language, the homophobia, the casual sort of misogyny, the, the callousness about AIDS and stuff like that? The role of a provocateur is utterly gone now. And I'm not even saying he was necessarily being a provocateur. Maybe he wasn't a great comedian. He, he eventually apologized for that stuff. But my point is not to slam Eddie Murphy, but my point is to say, you never know what's going to have legs afterwards. And I wonder, right. that's true. I wonder what the, I mean, I guess I know partly from my own experience and from our own experience, but there is a, a, a you have to sort of be aware of the times, but also sort of be apart from them. And not mm-hmm. not be concerned because, like, I I don't think anyone in in 1983 would have said what I just said about peanuts versus Eddie Murphy, but I do think it's true. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, Schultz definitely was you know reaching for all of America, right? And so he knew everybody was listening, so he was not going to offend anybody. His career depended on it. Yeah, and it seems like the people who part of who they are is that they won't offend anybody it's it seems like it's like at the end of their career often that's when they're the most revered which is not necessarily true of other people who are maybe trying to be in the right. midst of the culture and right on the cutting edge and you know i think of mr rogers out for years and years and mm-hmm. years he was just chugging along this somewhat watched show on pbs for years and years and years and years and then when we lose him everyone's like oh wait a second yeah. Who was this guy? Or I think of um, who's another example of that? Bob Ross, the painter, also yeah, a PBS right. thing, <laughs> painting happy little trees, and it was just a kind of a, this low hum in the background of popular culture. And all of a sudden, when he's gone and he's making not, nothing anymore, people mm-hmm. are like, "Wait, who was this guy? What was right. this?" So who <laughs> will so be strange. who will be remembered longer, Mister Rogers or Lenny Bruce? Probably because Mr. Lenny Rogers. Bruce invented the provocateur right. by being as outrageous. Yeah. As and possible. I guess if you're cutting, you can't be cutting edge in the future because you cut the edge. Whoa! <laughs> and now there's another edge somewhere else that someone's cutting, and so you're just a part of the landscape. So I guess maybe that's part of the reason why some of that stuff just doesn't. Another work. thing is that's interesting. This is maybe possibly tangential, but people who are cutting edge, but nobody follows them at the time. I think of like Big Star, the pop man that uh, like. I mean, they were a Beatlesque pop band in the '70s at the time when nobody was just into it. Right? Yeah, and then those people can be revered, but maybe through by academics or yeah, yeah, know, students of a field of something. Right, right, yeah. But it, it, it's no. It's usually not somebody who's been as established for fifty years like Schultz was. Right, because where do you go back to? You go back to the the beginning or. You don't go back to the middle and go like, this was the greatest stuff. I don't know if that's true of anybody. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. mid-career, this is his best stuff. Most people flame out at some point. Well, you have people like with the two half careers, like someone like Will Eisner, who just like, if you can reinvent yourself totally, that's a thing, too. Yeah. Yeah. And it's rare, but it does happen. But Eisner was, at least his work was better known when he was starting out, because at least it was in newspapers. Mm-hmm. Later on, yeah, I mean, every comic book guy, you know, worships Eisner, but the circulation on those reprints was probably not very huge. No, I can't no. imagine. No. no. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I mean, you can't really be writing for posterity, I guess, because you cannot predict the future. No one can. Well, you, you can you can go to something that's universal, right, that you know, like Schultz is kind of staying in the center of something. Like we were saying, he's not on the edges usually. And maybe, I don't know if that does give you a better chance for being remembered. In, well, it, it, it is funny because like uh, in preparation for this, I pulled up some, cause I 
wasn't sure I had the ears right. So before I started talking about this, I wanted to check. And I listened to the Eddie Murphy Ice Cream Man story from that album. And it is brilliant and funny and would still be loved and listened to by anyone today. And you, because it is about a more universal thing. And it's still his voice. There's no question. It's still edgy. It's still all of that stuff. But it's it's not a viewpoint that excludes people. It's not, it's, I guess it's, you know, it's really not a, a, it's difficult to not exclude people is what I'm saying, especially when you're doing humor, because you think someone always has to be the butt of the joke, but that's not necessarily true. And sometimes the butt of the joke, I guess, could be you. Yeah. Well, I'm guessing that just from the title, that's about childhood. Mm -hmm. We're generally, you know, yeah, I'm sure even Lenny Bruce talking about his childhood would not be X-rated. Right. Because that's more of a universal experience. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's get to these strips because uh, I actually do have uh, something to say about pieces of them, the little chunks happening. Well, know? that's great okay. because as luck would have it, we're doing a podcast about it right now. No kidding. So, yeah. So if you characters out there want to follow along, you could do a couple things. The first thing you got to do is you got to go there to unpackingpeanuts.com and sign up for our newsletter. It's the Great Peanuts Reread. Then once a month, you will get um, an email from us just once. We're not going to spam you, but it will tell you what we are going to be covering to the best of our ability anyway. And then you can go over to gocomics.com and get this for free. You can read any of the peanut strips you want from the beginning right through to the end. So you can just type in the dates that uh, we're going to discuss, read along with us and away you go. Uh, So with that in mind, away we go. January 3rd, Peppermint Patty is sitting in class and she's wearing a ski cap on top of her head and she addresses the teacher. This, this is a ski cap, ma'am. Then with a smile on her face, she says, my dad took me skiing yesterday. We had a great time. In panel three, she says, yes, I suppose I should take it off during class. And then panel four, she says, these two. And we see that she is also wearing her skis, uh, which look ridiculous sitting in the uh, in the little desk. So the reason I picked this, I, I really like Peppermint Patty's love of her dad. Like this feels to me like she is doing this because she wants everyone in school to know that her dad took her skiing and they had a lot of fun. <laughs> it's not just that the the hangover, she wants the the fun to continue. I th- I feel like it was important to her that she wanted to to tell everybody about this. <laughs> it's a good theory. That's great. Yeah. I remember when I was a kid in 6th grade, my mom or my mom, my dad took me and my friend to see the Harlem Globetrotters. <laughs> And uh, it was kind of far to go, like it wasn't right in our area. So it was a big deal that we got to go. And yeah, we, me and him brought the little uh, flyers that we got and the, the signatures and all that stuff on it. And it was, it was just like such an exciting, like little celebrity moment. Oh, my dad did this for me. So I feel hmm. like that's what's going on here with Peppermint Patty. You may be right. And I, uh, that makes total sense. Even though there's, it's the only basketball game I've ever seen in my life. My dad took me to see the, the Harlem Globetrotters. Yeah. Probably because he knew that it was going to be funny. So even if I didn't yeah. know what was going on, I'd at least laugh. Yeah. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, I remember it being funny. I don't remember anything else about it, though. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. They definitely put on a good show, especially back in the you know the 60s through the 80s, I guess I would say. They were huge. The Harlem Globetrotters? Yeah. Oh, that was fun. Mm. They're still around, though. And speaking of theories and good theories, here's a bad theory I brought up earlier. I thought that the dating of putting the year after the handwritten uh, oh, yeah. month and day on Schultz's strips at the beginning of the year might have had to do with him being in the hospital and that there might be some mix up because he was working so far ahead. Yeah. I see in 1983, he's doing it again for the first seven days and he does it again in 1984. I don't know how far out he does it, but maybe somebody was requesting that at the syndicate or something. It's not every day. Probably wasn't related to his illness. Oh, yeah. yeah, Just the first seven days of the. Did not. Yeah, first seven days of the year. So weird. So, yeah, something was going on. Well, maybe he knew there was going to be a podcast someday and people would want to know. Just make it easier for us. Yeah. yeah, he just wanted to. He just wanted to trip me up, so so I'd say something stupid. And <laughs> he was very successful in that. I think he's very successful about that a lot. <laughs> he's a genius. He's a genius. 
January 4th. Schroeder and Lucy are hanging out at uh, Schroeder's piano in their classic position, and Schroeder says, Thomas Hardy saw a girl on a bus one day. He said she had, and then he quotes, one of those faces of marvelous beauty, which are seen casually in the streets, but never among one's friends. And Schroeder continues the quote, where do they come from? Who marries them? Who knows them? He wondered. (laughs) To this, Lucy says, who cares? And who is Thomas Hardy? And then in panel four, Schroeder just pulls the piano out from under Lucy, sending her back on her noggin, bonk, which is something he has been doing <laughs> as a new new bit in 1983. Good bit. A little more uh, surprised with how that last panel's going to Yeah, fall. a little slapstick yeah. uh, for people who don't care about Thomas Hardy. <laughs> and I'm one of them. That's right. Boy, I, I was actually quite literate, even though, you know, I was... What? 40 at the, 30 at the time. Uh, no, but as a kid, I read a lot of, you know, serious authors. And I've never read a Tom Hardy book. I have no re- understanding of why he, he would bring it, bring him up. I've seen a Thomas Hardy movie. I mean, I've seen Tess of the Durbervilles, but uh-huh. I have not read any of his, because he was both a poet and a novelist. So I uh-huh. guess this may count as an obscurity for many. Uh, Which of the <laughs> Hardy books? boys was he <laughs> i think he was well there's no chet was the other kid right <laughs> which oh yeah and, and and those books are talk about public domain we get heart i'm waiting for that hardy boys movie to come out because it's you know those characters first book or two are oh, in public domain. oh yeah we're yeah, getting yeah. way off topic <laughs> another thing about this strip you know when i'm reading it i assume he was going to use this quote as somehow to be taken as some sort of insult about Lucy. Cause he's mm-hmm. talking about faces. She's always talking about, you know, she has a cute face. She has a pretty face. Right. And he's talking about marvelous faces, marvelous beauty. But, and then, but that doesn't, that's not the butt of the joke. Maybe he started that way. And then he, this is where he wound up. He just kind of surprised himself with a. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Total. You know, the other thing, uh, if we talk about crazy theories, we had this strip a year or so ago, or I have no idea it, it, anymore when it was, but where Schroeder had a Valentine ready for Lucy, but then she like opens up her mouth and says a bunch of stuff and he gives it to her as almost an insult, but he did have it previously. Uh-huh. If yeah. Lucy didn't have a terrible attitude, that could have been the setup for a compliment. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. but yep. she blew it again. Yeah, and, and the if we were going to play with that theory, just three days prior, we had a fourth panel, Schroeder, Lucy, where he's pulling the panel away. So maybe, maybe she, who knows, maybe he was going for something else, and then he was like, wait, I can just do that same joke again, and it would be a surprise. <laughs> January 8th, Schroeder and Lucy again hanging out at the old piano. And Lucy says, I know you love your piano more than you love me. I can live with that. Then in panel three, she says, who knows? Maybe someday things will change. Then in panel four, with a slight smile, she says to herself, I'm happy just being in the on-deck circle. I wonder what would happen, because I know uh, Peanuts was published not in newspapers here in Italy, but in a magazine called Linus or Linus. Mm -hmm. There's, I would say, roughly one quarter of the strips are baseball oriented and virtually no one in this country understands baseball baseball <laughs> so i wonder if they would have skipped strips like this which mm. would mean absolutely nothing you couldn't even translate this well are you or you would you translate uh, and i don't know maybe is anyone out there a translator who knows but would you translate it to an idiom that makes more sense locally like but, w- would but you what what's different- what sport i mean you well, know, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I mean, soccer doesn't have an on deck circle. I don't imagine you know, <laughs> yeah. the, the next person waiting. Anyway, I wonder if they just cut all the baseball strips because can, you can't explain baseball. It's impossible. No, <laughs> right? And I, I didn't know what the on deck circle was. I had to look it up. Really? And, but it, it, it didn't take away the what well, the circle. What, what what the heck is a circle? Oh, you got to stand in there so you don't get beamed. On deck circle. I was like, what is this, a cruise reference? (laughs) I didn't know. So, yeah, that's, but so I didn't know it, but I still didn't mind the strip. So, I don't know. Maybe they they just keep it in there and it, or it could be just, it it has whatever you take it. uh, You know, I'm I'm happy just flying standby. 
Like you could, right? Just something that means yeah, the same maybe. thing that you're yeah. up next. Yeah. But, no, but I, I think it's actually a very good joke. And I, that's why I picked it. I think it's actually a good punchline. Except, mm-hmm. you know, 90% of the world would not understand it. <laughs> right. But you do get the gist of it. I'm speaking as somebody who didn't know for sure what it was. Uh-huh. You do understand that you're part of a group that is in the se- in the back waiting, hoping for their chance and their time. Yeah. So oh, maybe it's time. like a like in a, in an opera. You have the who's what do they call in the wings? The understudy, the understudy. Yeah, understudy waiting yeah. for the lead to get sick or something. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, okay. I've got a new stupid theory okay. regarding the dates. Uh, I noticed in the Go Comics version, which they where they haven't taken out the copyright uh, slug line for United Feature Syndicate which they have in the Fantagraphics books. <laughs> it says, 82. It says ni- copyright 1982 up until January 8th, and he switches over to 83, and then he no longer puts that date in there. So maybe, I don't know, maybe he pastes a bunch of them down, and he has some leftovers, and he, <laughs> and if there's a difference in the date of what the copyright says and what he put on the paper, maybe he adds 83 instead of having to scrape Ooh. up the other piece so that's Wait, my new so, theory. so what your theory includes the fact that schultz himself placed the the copyright notice oh i, I believe he, he did yeah i think he did because he had yeah, that was part of his aesthetic choice so yeah i don't oh. think he wanted that to go to somebody else so anyway yeah, yeah so he didn't want to waste extras because that would yeah, right perfectly yeah. good because like copyright. a nickel to get new ones <laughs> that's, that's right <laughs> yep january 9th it's a Sunday and Woodstock is out in the snow and he looks like he's rolling up a big snowball and he does that for a few panels and then we see what he's been doing. He has been decorating a scraggly little tree with five miniature Woodstock sized snowmen, which are just the cutest thing in the world. All have different little hats on, which is very <laughs> important. So then Woodstock goes to Snoopy and we can grok that he's telling him, come see my cool little snowman thing. Unfortunately, by the time they get there, the sun has beat down and melted all the tiny little snowmen, which really upsets Woodstock. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just that look on his face. So then in uh, the penultimate panel, we see Woodstock walking away, very upset, and he picks up the five hats that were on the snowmen and puts them all on top of his own head. Marcy, looking outside the window, uh, says to Peppermint Patty, who is watching television in the background, you know what I just saw? A tiny bird just walked by with five hats on his head, and I think he was crying. <laughs> to which Peppermint <laughs> Patty says, you're weird, Marcy. That's yeah, pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, Marcy is very perceptive. <laughs> <laughs> Those are, that's a good prescription in her glasses. I love that Peppermint that Patty detail. doesn't even give a look. Like, that. not even worth a look over the shoulder. Just, like, forget it. <laughs> yeah. And there's so many great little visuals here, like you said, the, the the picture of Woodstock looking up at the five snowmen happily, who are all smiling in his tree, mm-hmm. and then his happy pronouncement to Snoopy that uh, what he's just done is is adorable as well. Yeah, and then all those those sad little hats <laughs> lying on the <laughs> ground up beneath the scraggly tree. I love the sun how he draws the heat of the sun. Uh, that's not something I've seen him do before. And it looks real good. Yeah. He works really well. Like the wobbly lines that kind of suggest the heat is floating in the air. And yeah, really cool. And uh, the third or the, uh, yeah, the second from last panel rather uh, with Woodstock, uh, <laughs> just with a little uh, s- smoke over his head and that look of despair. That's just fantastic. And I love it when Schultz takes us to some surreal, he builds a surreality on a surreality on a surreality. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you wind up with that second to last panel. Mm-hmm. And then he points it out to you how far he's taken you by some character noticing it and talking about it. Uh, there's a couple of sequences this year that he really starts piling up the absurdities to an absurd point way beyond what I can accept. <laughs> but for some reason, this one didn't bother me. <laughs> so you're with Marcy on this. It's this is not. <laughs> <laughs> January sixteenth, Lucy uh, is saying to someone, and I don't think you'll ever change. And then we see in the next panel, it is Linus, 
And she says, so there, and sticks her tongue out at him. Charlie Brown is watching the whole scene. Linus, though, fights back and says, oh, yeah, you should talk. You're the crabbiest person in the world. Linus continues as Lucy rolls her, uh, her eyes at him. And you always have to have your own way. And talk about loud, you're always yelling. And are you ever willing to share? No, not you. And you always think you're right. You never admit you're wrong about anything. Lucy whirls around and says, well, at least I don't go around dragging a stupid blanket. She walks off a look of smug satisfaction on her face. Then in the last panel, Charlie Brown says to Linus, beat you again, huh? And then Linus says, not really. I had more shots on goal. Funny, you should... Another sports reference. Yeah, which I didn't understand. I've never heard this expression. Well, that's interesting. Well, I understand it, but but you can have a million shots on goal if you don't score... You still lose. Okay. I, I <laughs> grasped it was hockey, but it didn't mean anything to me. Well, uh, you know, a, a shot on goal means you took a shot, it, but it doesn't mean you can miss them all. They could oh, all okay. be deflected by the by the goalie. Oh, it sounded like a free shot or something. If no, you no, no. Or something. Yeah, no, no, no. It just means within the course of the game, how many times did you shoot? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So that doesn't matter. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, so Linus is wrong here, right, Jimmy? You're, you're oh, that's saying, what I'm saying. Lucy, pro- Lucy's won zero in the game. Yeah, of Lucy hockey. has won one zero. Yeah, you might think you had a moral victory, but it doesn't reflect in the standings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's interesting to me about this trip is he brings back the blanket. Yeah. As a gag. Now mm-hmm. he'd pretty much kicked the habit by this point, and in the last bunch of years, like the whole seventies occasionally they'd show him carrying it, but nobody ever referred to it. And so we're kind of back on blanket topic again this year. Yeah. Which I found unusual because Linus, I feel, has been underused. And it looks like Schultz might agree and kind of went back to one of the things that made Linus really special was was the security blanket. Yeah, he's, mm-hmm. he's now using again as as a gag, as a setup. Yeah, I feel like there's an aspect of Schultz now that's realizing the scope of what Peanuts is and was, and 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 what it all it contains, and how much of that matters to people. And it there's a feeling almost like, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but almost like he's viewing this now as a legacy strip. And that's the tone of the eighties where it's a lot, it's a lot less of moving in strange, deeper personal new directions and a lot more of, you know, reframing and replaying some of the things that people really loved about the strip. I think that's where he's getting this creativity from rather than exploring new directions. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. That makes total sense. Mm -hmm. It, It reminds me a little bit of McCartney. Who, yeah. who was stabbing ahead on trying to break some new musical ground. But every now and then he'd do an album that was definitely thinking back to Beatley music. Right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, Schultz is doing, especially, I think, with Linus this year. And he's hesitantly using some of the newer characters a little bit more. Like Rerun comes in again later in the year. Yeah. So I don't know whether it's just a, a, a wellspring for, for gags that maybe, you know, after so many strips, it's harder to come up with something new. And so, well, oh, that always worked. Let's try that again. Yeah. And we've right. been saying for quite some time that Schultz's life, a lot of it is running licensing helping with animated specials and all of that, but force him to kind of look at what he's done in the past versus just today. So that's probably been a big part of his life for a while. And maybe that helps him remember and go back to the things he's done where he wouldn't necessarily revisit it himself. If it wasn't being brought back before him all the time through licensees or Mm -hmm. all that. Yeah. Well, yes. And I will say, I want to discuss a little bit more of that when we get to some of those rerun strips, because I do think uh, it ties in a little bit with the the animation that's going to be happening in 83. Another thing I want to bring up, this might end up being a big topic, is streakiness in, in, in creativity. Mm. Everybody who's 
been doing creative activity for a long time knows that sometimes inspiration, sometimes it flows, sometimes it doesn't. And I know we're often trying to tie it in with biography. Like, well, okay, he was sick. Okay, one of his kids, his kids were around. Right. But uh, generally, I think it doesn't have have to do with anything. It's it's very mysterious. It's like magic. Yeah. But sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's impossible to come up right. with ideas. And I found like the beginning of this year seemed extremely strong. Mm-hmm. Considering I, the last half of 82, I, I didn't find much in, right. very inspiring. And then all of a sudden at the beginning of the year, I, here I'm picking like four strips out of the first two weeks. <laughs> wow. And it's like, whoa. So all of a sudden it's like flowing again. And yeah. he's, he's coming up with good stuff. And then it, again, it, it slipped back into the fact that you know, the as I got further into the year, there were fewer and fewer, and there were some that I considered. Well, this is he's just milking, you know, a bad idea for a long time. Well, you know, I wonder if that's for a, a daily cartoonist. If the cycle of the year does affect your creativity, and like, all right, new year, starting from because you, you never get a real ending. So maybe the new year is like the time where. Oh, this is like a new project. Cause I love the beginning of a project when you're just fresh and it's all starting. It feels like you've leveled up somehow. And then as the project wears on, you know, you lose, you lose steam a little bit. Maybe that's just how it is with the year for a cartoonist. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also our, our streakiness, I think as readers, I picked like one strip in the first, <laughs> first 75 days. So, you know, maybe that's where I was as a reader. I wasn't as receptive or I wasn't as, as in tune with Schultz at the moment. You know, maybe that's because I had a bad lunch or, you know, who knows? <laughs> well, yeah. And those are factors that you cannot control. Yeah. right? <laughs> and plus the fact that we are reading, at least for me, I, I essentially read an entire year in three days. Right. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, as we get near the end of the year, it's, of course, it's, it it's fatigue. It's fatigue. And yeah. so I, I'm coming into 1983 mm-hmm. after a five day break. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a combination of things. But definitely there's periods where he's on more than other periods. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> January 28th. Peppermint Patty's in school again and wearing a stocking cap again, but this time she's really got it pulled down tight. <laughs> she says, Yes, ma'am. It was very cold walking to school this morning. My cap? You want me to take off my cap? Right. Anything you say. So she does, and in panel three, we see her hair with static electricity is, let's call it, askew. (laughs) And then in panel four, she says, put it back on? Yes, ma'am. And she does. (laughs) I just love the drawing in this. I love all the drawings. I love Peppermint Patty in the ski cap when it's pulled all the way down like that. That's just great. And of course, I love panel three. Yeah, she says her hair is like straw, and he really makes it look like straw in that third panel. Yeah. March 7th. Okay, this is um, in the midst of uh, of a long sequence here where Snoopy and the Beagle Scouts in their Foreign Legion um, attire are attempting to help Spike, who is being attacked by coyotes. <laughs> you know. As, <laughs> that old <story>. As happens. <laughs> as, sure. <laughs> super relatable. So anyway, one of the uh, the little Beagle Scouts runs up to Snoopy and Snoopy says, what's this? You've intercepted one of the enemy's secret messages. <laughs> this really made me laugh. Snoopy looks at it. Hmm. But it is, of course, upside down. <laughs> but we can tell because we know that it says we attack at midnight. Snoopy, however, is baffled. However, the Beagle Scout points to the paper chirps something and Snoopy turns it right side up and says, oh really? By golly, you're right. And then in panel four, we've broken their code. I broke <laughs> it in the, panel two. Yeah, <laughs> the little bird uh, scout rolls his eyes at Snoopy. Oh man, I it's so dumb. I love that. That just made me laugh. <laughs> well, you did pick one from the sequence I was talking about earlier. The, the absolute insanity of this whole sequence. <laughs> It just keeps accelerating. Yeah, I mean, Spike, 
yeah, they can accept Spike when he comes and visits Snoopy. But when these birds essentially walk from like Northern California to the desert, you know, these birds with like one inch foot span <laughs> or whatever you call it. What do you with call it? <laughs> no, when they walk, they're walking, yeah. they're pacing off inches. Okay. Dress this foreign legion. Kind of crazy. <laughs> uh, Spike. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Somehow encircled by coyotes mm-hmm. uh, who are like shooting rubber bands. <laughs> and then the rescue comes in the form of Snoopy doing his helicopter thing. I mean, it's just like you can't accept the initial premise and then like Right. <laughs> but I think and if how did he do get, this? he call he calls Snoopy on the phone from this hole in the desert. <laughs> He sends a message. So he mails it. He somehow oh, he mails, mails it. The note. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he mails it, which is going to take like a week. That's, and how did he get I to the post office if he's hiding behind a? <laughs> I don't. Yeah, it's it's. He must have had some bunny friends or what little creatures skidding around there. Past that, it makes total sense him. to me. This exact thing happened to me last week. I swear. Really? It's like totally, totally relatable. Yeah. Boy, and and that the reason that the coyotes are mad is because of his his uh, his false advertising from his real estate company about giving you an ocean view. <laughs> this could have been a this insane. This could have been an animated special. This whole story. It is, yeah, so maybe it is. I don't That's know. about as many levels of surreality as I think I've found <laughs> so far on this trip. Yeah, Michael, this is pretty pretty far. Yeah, <laughs> although not enough unnecessary quotation marks. <laughs> March 20th, uh, we start off with a wide panel, it's a Sunday here, of Charlie Brown and Linus kind of walking out in a in, in a, a landscape we really haven't seen. They're like climbing a hill with a big tree atop. Perhaps it's the party tree on a, in, in Hobbiton, I don't know. Or the shoe tree from Jeff McNally. <laughs> another, yes, another uh, editorial cartoon looking tree for sure. And Linus says to Charlie Brown, what are you thinking about Charlie Brown? Charlie Brown answers, am I wrong or did there used to be more trees than there are now? And as they're walking, we see Snoopy and Woodstock sitting in <laughs> Woodstock's uh, little nest. And it's as cute as could be. And Linus answers Charlie Brown, they say that when the colonists first came to this country, a squirrel could travel treetop to treetop from the Atlantic to the Mississippi River without ever touching the ground. Snoopy and Woodstock <laughs> Look at each other as if, well, this should be a challenge. Mm-hmm. They make it one panel, two panels, uh, and then in the third panel of hopping from treetop to treetop, they splat, land right on their heads, bonk, bonk. <laughs> and in the last panel, Snoopy says to Woodstock, either that was a long time ago or that was some squirrel. <laughs> Rocky. That's a weird first panel. I, I, I love, love Woodstock's it. commitment to acting like a squirrel so that he has to fall on his head, even though he can yeah, fly. Yeah, he can fly. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess technically so could Snoopy. That's true. He could helicopter his way down. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very different tree in panel one. It yeah. is a good old tree. I like a good tree drawing for sure. And he is really nice treeing it tree. up. Yeah, his uh, his tree tops too are surprisingly like I don't want to say realistic, but like he's really drawing the leaves and stuff on there, as opposed to just a normal peanuts tree would just be like a squiggly line indicating mm-hmm. the leaf, you know. And these are all yeah. really, really detailed. Reminds you how good a draftsman he is and how detailed yeah. he can go. He's, he's just so used to boiling things down. Yeah, and his scraggly trees are always the best. I love them. All right, so uh, how about we take a break there, and uh, we'll come back and do the other strips on the other side. While we're taking a break, you know what you characters could do? It'd be great if you go over to the website, sign up for the Great Peanuts reread, and while you're there, uh, visit the store. Maybe you could check out some of our work or a t-shirt or something like that. That would be really helpful to keep the podcast going. So we'll see you on the other side of the break. Hi, everyone. We all love listening to Jimmy describe what's going on in a peanut strip. But did you know that comics are actually a visual medium? That's right. You can see them anytime you want at gocomics.com or in your very own copy of The Complete Peanuts, available from Fanagraphics. Plus, if you sign up for our monthly newsletter, you'll know in advance which strips we're talking about each week. Learn more about The Great Peanuts Reread at unpackingpeanuts.com. And we're back. 
Hey, Liz, I'm hanging out here in the mailbox. Do we got anything? We do. We have a couple of new listeners, I think. Autumn Faulkner writes, Hello, I love your podcast. Peanuts has been something I cherished since I first really took notice of it when I got to play Schroeder in You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. All right. My director was cast as Charlie Brown in one of his school shows, so I guess he wanted to share the magic of Peanuts with us. My favorite thing about this whole strip is how Charles Schultz pursued his dream. He didn't even like the name Peanuts, but he went through with it. Oh, well, thank you, Autumn. We really appreciate yeah, listening. Thank you, Autumn. And Shauna Hickey writes, I found your podcast a little late in the game, and so far I've only made it through 1963. However, it's been a pure joy this whole time. Thank you so much for doing this podcast. I love going through all the strips with you. I've been a huge Peanuts fan my entire life, and it's wonderful to hear other fans who love it as much as I do. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank yeah, you thanks. so much. I'm glad you're along the journey with us here and catch, catching up. <laughs> That's a lot of stuff to catch up on, right? I can't believe how fast we've gone through these these years. Uh, yeah. You know, I would have. I would have gone slower had I had I realized that we'd actually achieve this. <laughs> All right. So if you want to get in touch with us, you can write us through our website, unpackingpeanuts at gmail.com and uh, send off your your comments or your your questions, anything you want to talk about. Uh, you can also call the Peanuts hotline and people haven't been calling. People have only been texting, but I would love for you guys to give it a ringy dingy so you could actually uh, get your voice on our podcast. Uh, you can call that number at any time of the day or night. 717-219-4100. Any time of the day or night, we would love to hear from you. Because remember, when I don't hear, I worry. All right. What do you guys say we get back to the strips? Sure. Sure. March 26th. This is the middle of a sequence where Peppermint Patty has convinced Charlie Brown to become her baseball team's mascot, which is a pelican, which is a great pelican costume that Charlie Brown is in. And uh, in this particular strip, Marcy has come uh, to talk to Chuck because she thinks he's He's being taken advantage of. So Charlie Brown dressed in his Pelican outfit with a propeller beanie on top of the Pelican's head, by the way, says, Marcy, what are you doing here? And Marcy says to Charlie Brown, I want you to take off that stupid costume, Charles, and stop letting yourself be humiliated. If you won't do it for yourself, do it for someone who likes you. She says to Charlie Brown, who is still wearing the pelican head. And then from inside the TV room, Sally yells out, kiss her, you blockhead. <laughs> now, we had a similar setup way back a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Was that Sally? And what did she say then? I don't remember. It was last episode. Was it last episode? Yeah. Way back. Last episode. <laughs> way back last episode. I was, it it Sal it was, was, was it Sally saying the same thing? Okay. I believe so, yes. Because yeah, I know I had the book Kiss Her You Blockhead. <laughs> so and I think it was selections from both of those. I so I'm not sure which one, but <laughs> I do like the costume. Oh, it's great. <laughs> the it's little, so yeah, the funny. little propeller beanie. And the funniest thing is, you know, Charlie Brown doesn't really have any noticeable hair to speak of on his head, and he's putting on this pelican costume that gives him this big patch of black curly hair in the back what the heck <laughs> yeah, I, yeah is it a is it a pelican with male pattern baldness that's what it kind of looks like that's really weird <laughs> well i guess this was the the cheapest costume <laughs> the one that was left you know <laughs> yeah he's schultz knows how to spot blacks here that's for sure yeah great 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 looking costume it really cracks me up uh, and uh, that wraps up. Charlie Brown gets out of it by sending Snoopy in his stead. So, and so that storyline <laughs> wraps up. Yeah. Oh, and it's interesting. You see, you know, he's spending, he's really trying to get that Pelican costume, right? It seems like because of the, the tremor, the hand tremor, the characters mm -hmm. that he knows how to draw really well, you don't see it as much because he's just zipping through the line on Marcy's mouth and all that. Cause that's stuff he's comfortable with, but something new, like the Pelican, you, you see, the hand moving more slowly and, and since it's a rhythmic tremor you can kind of see how fast it's like this this record of how fast he was drawing each line yeah you can really see it on the underside of that pe well the whole pelican costume as you say very interesting march 27th 
another Sunday. Starts off with a great symbolic panel of Peppermint Patty in boxing gloves, boxing um, <laughs> a three-ring binder, it turns out <laughs> to be. Uh, so in panel two, she is asleep at her desk with the binder open on her desk, which is a bad move. And then uh, she slowly slumps forward as she sleeps. And then in the third panel, or well, the fourth panel, rather, snap, her nose gets stuck in the binder and she yells, yipe. And so now we see the ba- the binder is in fact stuck to her nose, and she says, "Sorry, ma'am, my nose is caught in my binder. I'm trying not to scream. It's very painful." She gets up and she says, "May I have permission to see the school nurse, or maybe the custodian? We may need a pair of pliers." Then, bonk! She walks into the door. She tries to leave the classroom. <laughs> now she's seeing stars again and says, "Sorry, ma'am, I'm having trouble seeing where I'm going." And she <laughs> walks. With the binder still stuck to her face, her hands out in front of her, she feels her way. And then in the last panel, we see she has returned to her desk, her nose completely bandaged. And she says, fortunately, the senior prom isn't for another 10 years. Oh. I don't get the mechanics of this. The binder? Oh, yeah, because you're not the Trapper Keeper generation. (laughs) Oh, because I would assume that the thing that closes the rings is on the ends. No, if you just pressed, it would snap shut just like it does here. And your fingers would get caught regularly in those stupid things. Really? Okay. Yeah. yeah. But we love them. But they outlawed them, I assume. <laughs> uh, maybe they just yeah. I, the design. I think it was part of the same bill that outlawed lawn darts. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so what were we thinking, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those things can be like pretty nasty. I've I've had some run ins for sure. It's oh yeah, yeah. Now there's something unique about this strip uh, among all of the strips that we have seen up to date on these 30 some years that I haven't noticed before that, that is unique about this strip. Any guesses as what that might be? Uh, no blacks. Uh, no. No idea. He didn't sign it. <laughs> Whoa. That's weird. Isn't that odd? Yeah, he maybe just forgot. I guess he just did. forgot, I guess. I'm sure he was proud of the strip. He had a space to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess he so. just forgot. That's really strange. Oh, there you go. That is the kind of white hot excitement you're going to get on this podcast if you continue to stick with this. You will find <laughs> out things that you didn't know you cared about. My mind is blown. <laughs> <laughs> March 28th. Uh, we're back to the Pelican storyline. <laughs> Peppermint Patty uh, is uh, getting ready to take the field. Franklin and Marcy are there. Peppermint Patty says, where's our Pelican? The game is ready to start. Where's Chuck and the Pelican costume? Marcy says, I told him he shouldn't come. I told him it was degrading. <laughs> Peppermint Patty says, Marcy. Marcy says, that's my name. Peppermint Patty now screams to the heavens. Marcy, you got it right again. Yeah, Marcy, she's she's moving up in my list of favorite characters. Oh, that's awesome. I love Marcy. I yeah, uh, this reading uh has really leapt out to me as as a character I like and and someone that's really unique to to the Schultz world. You don't see a character like this in in other strips cuz she's so subtle. Yeah. And she can deliver these kind of punchlines which are just a total flat delivery. Yes. Against somebody who's screaming. You know, she's just saying it like, that's my name. Exactly. Exactly. And the joy with which she's doing it, even though it's so subtle, you know that her calmness, <laughs> she knows, is riling Peppermint Patty up even further, which I like. It's really yeah. good. Another reason I like it is I don't like this this thing where we have these subservient characters uh, mm. where somehow, you know, Definitely Peppermint Patty is the boss. Right. And but at some point this is her rebellion. Mm-hmm. Right. She's this is I mean, in her way of 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 saying get lost, just quietly saying, Yeah, you know, you can't tell me what to do. Right. Right. No. And she very much has that centeredness about her that you can't tell her what to do. And she always has Peppermint Patty's back. As long as she believes what Peppermint Patty is doing. But if she doesn't, she'll tell her, which is great. 
and tell her in this such a Marcy way, as you're saying, which is which is also a great and just a great aspect of Schultz as a cartoonist that he could pull that off. Yeah, it just plays so well into her matter of factness that she can have, although she often can speak what is, at least is oblique to Peppermint Patty. So, yeah. <laughs> April 15th. Oh, okay. So now this this is a, a sequence wherein Linus uh, is has given up his blanket and is going to try to essentially open up a school to teach other kids how to uh, give up their blankets. And now he's going door to door because this is bat- Linus back in fanatic mode. And he, he knocks on someone's door and he says, good morning, little girl. You sure are a cute little thing. I see you have a security blanket. And she does. It's a it's a character we've never seen. She's got a little bob haircut, a bow in her hair, and she is in classic thumb and blanket position herself. And in panel two, Linus, <laughs> very self satisfied, uh, he says, "Would you like to have me tell you how I broke myself of that habit?" The little girl snap <laughs> whips him with the blanket, sending him flying. And Linus, she goes back inside, and Linus yells after her, "Stupid kid!" Is this his commentary on AA? <laughs> no, <Maybe>. seriously. <laughs> I mean, because we've seen him go through withdrawals from the blanket way back in the day. Yeah. And now he's done it and he's he's preaching. He's telling yeah. other people how to do it. Well, quickly, speaking of AA, how are you on Infinite Jest? Where are we at? Hey, uh, episode 98. Oh my gosh, you're getting there. Yeah, Get wait. No, uh, one uh, a while ago, you said there's a a moment where it all comes together. Have I passed that? No, no. I said don't expect there to be a moment where it all comes together. <laughs> I thought there was a moment where suddenly it all makes sense and you realize. Why. No, oh yeah, no, no. I think that's maybe after this time on Earth. Maybe that will be one of the things revealed to us. <laughs> okay. but I, no, no. There's no plate where it all comes together. Sorry if I misled you. <laughs> all right. Well, I heard you wrong. Okay. <laughs> One thing that's interesting to me with this little girl that we've never seen before, uh, that he chooses to dress her in really classic little girl peanuts dress yeah. rather than something more modern. Why do you think he did that? That's a good question. I'm not sure. She's got the I mean, bow in the hair. That, She's got the dress with the The dress the with diagonals. the pattern that was very 50s, very patty. Uh, you know, I think Patty used to wear coats like that. And I don't know what kind of shoes do you call those with the the white and the it's like saddle shoes or I'm not sure what yeah. they'd be considered. They're very yeah. With the one drawn. difference from the early stuff is the the eyes. Of course, she has the the circle around the eye, like like Lucy had originally. Yeah, right. So it's like yeah. they've taken you far back to the older. Maybe that's to him that represents an older, more innocent time to make the joke in his mind funnier, the fact that she's going to snap him with her blanket. Yeah, maybe. This continues. And we actually have a a child uh, arrives at Linus's house for a meeting one night. Uh, Yeah, now that I'm saying it that way, Michael, I do hear what you're saying. (laughs) 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 Yeah, exactly. So a child, uh, but their identity is hidden because the kid has a blanket put over their head. So Linus uh, is saying to the child, I think the first thing we should consider about clinging to a security blanket is guilt. But the kid under the blanket says, I don't feel guilty. Uh, Linus is good. Now there's also embarrassment. The kid says, that's no problem either. (laughs) Then Lucy leans in from off panel and says, now mention stupidity. (laughs) (laughs) Very funny. This was a a little mystery here. Yeah, You kind of assumed it was the same kid the blanket and if that's what you're supposed to think i mean when you you encounter this mysterious person oh yeah who is it uh, oh was it the other kid yeah yeah doesn't the kid say it's randolph like the kid says his name's randolph or something like that <laughs> i don't know but yeah we have no idea who it is but here on april 22nd linus says to the kid under the blanket before we continue with your treatment we need to do something i'm going to ask you to take the blanket off your head and the kid says anything you say and then she reveals it is in fact sally who says it's me sweet babu (laughs) to which linus replies oh and his hair is stick straight and now this we talked with mrs Jeannie schultz about so hey liz can we go back in the time machine and revisit what mrs schultz had to say why certainly we can it's time 
<laughs> well, where did you come up with it from? Did it just something that popped in your head? It just head? popped in my head. Yeah. Is it weird that your well, phrase for for your your love is now a catchphrase for the entire planet? Well, and I don't know how it came out of my mouth. That's mm-hmm. so strange. Right, right. We don't know these things. It's but it it's it's such a great phrase, sweet baboo. Well, and then of course the thing is she torments him with it. Yeah. <laughs> He's off scene sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. With with a little arrow saying, I'm not sweet baboo. Yeah. Don't call me that. Yeah. So she loved it. But I'm assuming he didn't say that to you, though. <laughs> no. and I'm assuming that he enjoyed that very much. <laughs> wonder, when we're talking about it, when I actually did say and whether he reacted. I mean, I have no recollection. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, That's because you were just saying a thing. You were just living your life, having a normal day. You didn't realize you were going right. to be immortalized yet again. <laughs> yeah. How great was it having Mrs. Schultz on this show? Right? I mean, that was just yeah. fantastic. I'm yeah. still so grateful. All right. So what do you guys think about this? It was a real surprise, even though I <laughs> glanced at it before I read the strip. Ah, uh, yes. Now, <laughs> if this was in the animated special, if they use this would she have been disguising her voice oh that you know what i don't think they ever did animate it but boy that would have actually been really funny <laughs> to have the kid go oh hello not you know to the kid try to disguise her voice that could have been really funny but i don't think they ever did one thing i wish he had done you know whenever there's there's like a there's two realities going side by side one thing you think yeah. is happening what's really happening i always love it if the whoever's creating that can make both realities work at the same time without somebody having to lie. That to me is cool. Here, if she's saying oh. that she's somebody she's not, was that, I, that would to me be unnecessary. I would wish that the flow of whatever happened, she didn't have to lie to then reveal herself because then she revealed herself in truth and wasn't just, well, he's just Although she would have been lie. lying. Well, yes, but she's lying that she's addicted to a blanket. Well, she didn't have to do that either. You know, it could have been Linus going, oh, I see, here's another person who's addicted to a blanket. I see you're on. You know, it, it could have been I see. that Sally never, never yeah, yeah, yeah. contradicted what the payoff is at the end. Okay. It's, it's Sally all along. She just wanted to get, find a way to get in and mess with him or whatever. Somebody's got to psychoanalyze the Van Pelt parents. Because, I mean, you have <laughs> I'm telling you. Lucy with the psychiatrist booth, Linus with his therapy, blanket therapy here. Mm-hmm. What's with these kids? <laughs> I'm telling you, they are very Salinger esque. Something is, that a, is definitely going is it, on. Is another, that another Peanuts worldwide thing? The Van Pelts, you know. The Van Pelts, yeah. And you would have to do it like a parody of like a Wes Anderson movie, like the Royal Tenenbaums, Bombs, yeah. but it's just the Van Pelts. Upstairs, really downstairs, fun. parents, uh-huh, children. Yeah. 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 And oh, man, having really... a, a third kid who like nobody even notices is out there. <laughs> Are we I, ever told what what the parents do? Is there ever hit that ever hit so, no. What do you guys think? think? So, who no. do you think? Who do you think Linus's father is? What does he? Do? He's a psychologist, I'm sure. I yeah, I, I always feel something like that too. They're both doctors. I'm thinking yeah, the the mom is maybe a psychiatrist and the dad is a college professor. <laughs> That's what I think. yeah. No, that that would work. Yeah, those 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 clock to me. Yeah. So anyway, this uh, this trauma sends Linus back to the blanket. <laughs> <laughs> which is how Schultz wraps that one up. <laughs> April 26th, Linus is again uh, in thumb and blanket position, a classic. And he's sitting on the bench next to Charlie Brown in the baseball game. He walks up to bat, he strikes out, then he sits back down and puts the blanket over his head, learning something from Sally, I guess. <laughs> this is a total throwback from like 15 years. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, right? this, this could have been a 1965 strip. Yeah. Uh, this is what I mean by that, that him feeling like they talked at the beginning, that legacy uh, idea of the strip where he is going back and you know, playing the hits. Like we've talked about it before. Mm-hmm. I, I like it. Yeah. How's this for a mind blowing theory in the fourth panel? That isn't Linus under there. It's Randolph. <laughs> <laughs> Twilight Zone. <laughs> April 29th, 
Game is over. Charlie Brown and Linus are walking home. Charlie Brown says, 207 to nothing. We have the worst team in the history of baseball. I wish I could talk with the man who invented baseball, says Charlie Brown, as he and Linus rest their heads at the thinking wall. In panel three, Linus says, to get his advice? Charlie Brown answers, no, to apologize. (laughs) That's a great punchline. I'm so glad we didn't have to do an obscurity on uh, Ebner Doubleday. (laughs) Because that could get pretty heated. I mean, that's a controversial figure. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, well, I had uh, it, there's a, one of my favorite things I ever did, and I had I only had to fight with Scholastic for four months to get it in there, but it was in the book Seven Good Reasons Not to Grow Up. It's a list of things people have told you that are true that aren't true, and one of them is uh, that Abner Doubleday invented baseball. Oh, and it is it is contested. People, uh, he well, didn't it's, really it's baseball. flat out not true. It was flat out not true. Right? No, I mean <laughs> I, here I am. I was being diplomatic, but yeah. No, it's not an entry. I mean, here I am in Italy, but we have some English friends, and they go like, "We don't understand baseball. What is baseball?" So I describe baseball, and they go, "Oh, rounders." <laughs> okay, <laughs> so it's a game, and they, I go, "Rounders? Yeah, yeah. You have a pitcher, and you have a batter, and they hit the ball, and they run around the bases." Right. <laughs> oh, well, so much for Abner. <laughs> do you remember those of you who lived in the 70s there was an abner doubleday commercial where his wife is is saying oh, abner don't take the world serious and then he's like that's it the world series does that ring a bell it was like for no, carefree sugarless I gum or something sort of remember that yes <laughs> very strange oh man may 6th lucy is in her now semi-standard position of hanging out in her beanbag chair and she says all right if everyone in this house hates me so much i'll just leave that'll make you all happy she says won't it as she storms around then she stomps back to the (laughs) beanbag gets right back into it and says why should i make them all happy (laughs) (laughs) actually i think the beanbag chair is is the great innovation of of peanuts in this period (laughs) It's pretty good. <laughs> it's weird watching her head just pop up out of the middle of it. Plus, it saves a, it saves a lot of drawing too. <laughs> it really does save a lot of drawing. Yeah, it just that's just such a <laughs> funny image. It really is. But by now, we all know what it is. You know, can you imagine? Yeah, just taking that and taking <laughs> away everything and just putting that image out there in the world, and people are like, what? What the heck is going you, on? What is it? Yeah. It's, <laughs> Uh, are beanbags chairs still popular? I wish I had one. No, I think the National I Bean so. Council lost their lobby. Oh, did they? Well, that, that's, that'll get you every time. No, the, the jumping beanbag chair. <laughs> <laughs> that would defeat the purpose. I think it's, it's, it's the air stuff now. It's like the blow-up chairs, right? That's That kind of replaced the most uh, beanbag yeah, chairs. Yeah, but that's not as fun. Because yeah. you can really get the wiggle the the beanbag chair around to get yeah. the, the maximum amount of beans in the right the place beanage. for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, you think it's ripe for a comeback with some sort of new memory foam component or something. Yeah, yeah. That would be nice. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. We should bring them back. Uh, beanbag chairs, Bud Blake. <laughs> oh, this is... I, I ventured outside the Amelia verse recently, which is always a mistake. And we had, uh, we've said there's a couple things you should never talk about in public. One is your dreams. The other is your Dungeons and Dragons cartoon or uh, campaign. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm adding one. Your, your home brewed beer. <laughs> I, I, I'll just answer for every person who ever is, if you're a home brewer out there and you want to know the two questions, one, uh, do you want to try my home brewer? The answer is no. No matter who you're asking, the answer is no. And then the second question, did you like it? The answer is no. <laughs> so is this from experience? With, I'm just saying, look, I'm just saying it should be up there with Dungeons and Dragons and Dreams <laughs> in the verboten category. <laughs> June 26th. Linus and Lucy are sitting on little uh, stools, little mini bean bags, <laughs> watching TV. And Linus is having a drink of something and it causes him to cough. And he coughs in the next panel, and he coughs in the next panel. And Lucy says, what's the matter? But he's coughing really hard now and gagging. Cough, gag, cough. Lucy says, did you swallow wrong? 
You always drink too fast. Never. <laughs> always time for a little criticism. Are you choking? She says. Can you breathe? Are you all right? Answer me. Linus is coughing. Are you all right? <laughs> this is Linus is beside himself and he screams. Stop asking me questions. How can I answer when I'm coughing? <laughs> Lucy then sneezes. Achoo. Linus says, bless you. No, no, he doesn't yell. Linus says, bless you. And then Lucy screams, I hate people who say bless you every time you sneeze. <laughs> and then it ends with, brothers and sisters should never be in the same family, says Linus, <laughs> as they both go back to watching TV. That's funny. And it's a great punchline, which could have fit like a lot of different situations. It could have easily been a four panel yep. strip. But somehow he thought this was the best setup for brother sister antagonism. Yeah, I I I think this is one of his classic strips. This is up there with a bunch of other ones that with, with Linus and Lucy. <laughs> I've certainly been in in that both sides of this conversation. <laughs> it's very relatable. Man, one time I I ate us. I was eating like a Snickers bar. And it just went down the wrong way. Like it went down into my throat and it was like this coating. And so Ugh. I was, I was breathing like, <gasps> <gasps> and it's scary. as I'll get out. And that happened. I was in the theater. Oh my gosh. I was in the theater and like this film <laughs> of something went over my windpipe and I, I hadn't eaten anything. I was, I was just sitting there in this theater and it's like one of those like little off Broadway theaters in New York City, and I'm like in the middle near the front row. It's the worst. Oh, no. And he's like, and, <laughs> and, and you just feel it. It's like, <gasps> and it starts to get louder and louder because you realize you start to panic that I'm not getting oh, enough yeah. oxygen. And, <laughs> and, the, and it's like, do I get up? Do I leave? Because it's a long. Is it's one of those things where you get that's the, the walk of shame the back. So you have to go all the way out from the middle across all these other people. You're going, <gasps> and, and this uh, this actor is probably like 15 feet from me. It's <laughs> oh, it was the absolute worst. <laughs> oh. oh, that's terrible. All right, so guys, that brings us to uh, the end of this episode. Uh, we got another half of the year coming up next week, though. So make sure you come back here for that. If you want to keep the conversation going, you can email us through our website. We're unpackingpeanuts at gmail.com. You can uh, go there. You could support the show by joining our Patreon or, or buying a T-shirt or checking out one of our books. Uh, that would be great. If you want to follow us on social media, you we are at Unpack Peanuts on Instagram and threads and at Unpacking Peanuts on Facebook, Blue Sky, and YouTube. Other than that, we would just love for you to come back uh, next week where we tackle 1983 Part 2. So until then, for Michael, Harold, and Liz, this is Jimmy saying, be of good cheer. Yes! yes. Be, be of, of good, good cheer. cheer! Unpacking Peanuts is copyright Jimmy Gownley, Michael Cohen, and Harold Buckholtz. Produced and edited by Liz Sumner. Music by Michael Cohen. Additional voiceover by Aziza Shakrala Clark. For more from the show, follow Unpack Peanuts on Instagram and Threads. Unpacking Peanuts on Facebook, Blue Sky, and YouTube. For more about Jimmy, Michael, and Harold, visit unpackingpeanuts.com. Have a wonderful day, and thanks for listening. My mind is blown.